Hello, and welcome to the Joy of Morphology. Today, we will be looking at a type of trilobite belonging to the order of trilobites known as Phacopida. Let's get started. Trilobites are called trilobites because their bodies are made up of three lobes. Three lobes, trilobal, trilobite. These lobes consist of a central axial lobe and left and right pleural lobes. Trilobites are also divided into three body segments. The head segment, called the cephalon, the body segment, called the thorax, and the tail segment, called the pygidium. The thorax of the trilobite is further subdivided into segments, with the segments of the axial lobe of the thorax being called axial rings, and the segments of the pleural lobes being called pleura. Axial rings and pleura are separated by the axial furrow. The pleura are further divided by a pleural furrow that separates the anterior and posterior pleural bands or ridges. Not pictured here, but discussed during today's sketching session, the interior ends of the pleura form concave surfaces called articular facets that would have allowed the pleura to move over each other as the trilobite moved through its environment, or in some cases curled up into a ball defensively like some modern woodlice. The major features of the cephalon that are of interest to us today are the glabella, which is the interior most part of the axial lobe, and the eyes, which are very prominent in the phacopida order of trilobites. With the general information about trilobite anatomy out of the way, let's familiarize ourselves with this specific specimen. Now, one thing that I've always really liked about this particular specimen, and that I'm not sure what the species is, but I do know that it's uh, within the order of Phacopida. Um, one thing that's prominent about that order is this... Um, prominent glabella right here. The uh, basically the cephalon extension, the uh, the most anterior extension of the axial lobe. And in these guys they have a very prominent glabella that has always kind of reminded me almost of kind of a bulbous nose, which um, having that bulbous nose feature and being stone. Um, these guys have always reminded me of the trilobite equivalent of a lawn gnome. I mean, you can kind of just imagine him sitting there with a little conical red hat. Uh, actually, you don't have to imagine that. I've, I've drawn that. Anyways, with this guy in particular, another thing that you're going to notice about him is this kind of discontinuity right here. When you're looking at how this particular specimen lays, you have these segments in line, and then you have these segments in line, but they're not really in line with each other. So you have a very distinct discontinuity that looks like less of a feature of the organism itself and more a feature of how this organism was deposited into the sediment. So this is more of a depositional feature, where it looks like when this organism was deposited into the sediment, or buried by sediment, or however this organism came to be encased in uh, the sandstone matrix, um, there was more pressure applied to this posterior end than there was to this anterior end, which caused either 
uh, more separation of these uh, playeral um, segments or just a general compression into the sediment of this posterior end. So that's one thing that we're going to want to take into account as we're trying to work out um, the general shape and then defining more and more uh, specific details. So our plan of attack is we are going to use our ruler to establish specific reference points, so the overall length of the organism, the length of the uh, cephalon, the approximate location and size of these axial rings, and then the approximate size and location of the pygidium. And then we're going to use that to help us work out the general shape and then dial it in further and further with more detail until we have a point where we are comfortable. So let's start with that then. Um, first thing we're going to measure is from the anterior end of the glabella to the posterior end of the pygidium. And that looks to be approximately 19 and one half centimeters. So we'll use that as a kind of rough estimate. So from zero to 19 and one half. And we'll just kind of create this line right here between these two points. That's this imaginary line right about here-ish. And we'll use that to kind of work out what our differences in heights are between this anterior and posterior discontinuity here in a bit. But for right now, if we bring this down, that genial angle looks to be about seven and three quarters, say seven point eight, seven point eight centimeters between the end of the glabella and this kind of this this end of the uh, cephalon so we'll make that an approximation there and then between the end of the glabella and the anterior end of the pygidium here We'll call that about 15, 15 15.7, 15.7. Remember, we're wanting to use the same reference points, the same starting point for any of our measurements. So, for instance, if I were to, when we measure these axial rings here, we're going to want to measure from the, the interior end of the glabella. We're not going to want to come over here, take the measure to measure to here, and then measure between here and here, and then between here and here, and here and here, because then we'll start to compound um, rounding errors and eventually none of these 
none of these sizes will actually match up with what's being drawn. So you'll have very disproportionate um, components that don't fit spatially in a way that your eye can recognize from the photo, between the photo and the drawing. So we want to make sure that we're maintaining the same starting point for all of our measurements. So all of our measurements coming this way will all start from the anterior end of the glabella, right about here-ish. So then, we have this approximate line, and then we're going to try to get a good handle on where this line is. We're going to rotate our ruler 90 degrees, get an approximate idea of how tall that first ring is from that approximate location. So that's about 2.8 up. 2.8 centimeters up is approximately where that is. And we're just going to use that to give us kind of a, a rough estimate for where our, our high point is here. That wasn't terribly parallel. That's a little bit better. Get rid of this other stray line then. All right. So then from whoop. And it looks to be that that is sitting about 5.2 wanting to say 5.2 means it'll be about here-ish. And then... Once again, our approximate line, reference line for this, and then rotating our ruler 90 degrees again, say this end is approximately two and a half centimeters down. bottom of that is at approximately the lowest point is approximately six centimeters. Okay, so now what we've just created the the approximate lines for is the bottom of the cephalon here, the top of this, it's not actually an axial ring for the thorax, it's, a, it, it's, it's still on the cephalon. But this gives us our starting point here, this gives us our starting point here, and so let's grab two more approximate measurements here. Oh, a 
few more approximate measurements. Uh, so then. Okay. So we're going to want to try and get our axial rings measured out approximately roughly there. So we'll say that starting from here, count this bit right here as the start of this first thoracic axial ring. And said so that guy starts at about 5.7, 5 5.2. 5 yeah, 5.2. So if we move this to the 5.2 segment, that means that we are sitting at approximately 6.5 to 7.5 for that first ring. Six and a half to seven and a half. Seven and a half to approximately eight point four. to 9, let's just get 9 and 10, nine and 10 centimeters. Be eleven and twelve point two. Twelve point two. Thirteen, thirteen and a half. Thirteen, thirteen and a half, and fourteen point two. Thirteen, thirteen and a half, fourteen point two. Just to make sure that we're one, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So one more. This guy this should be this last guy right here. Should be about. Fifteen fifteen centimeter mark. All right.
2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then Pygidium over here. Cephalon this way. Genial angle here. Bottom of the cephalon here. And then we kind of work out where this guy is. So we will roughly work this out right quick. This angle right here, because it'll help us kind of shore up where this angle right here is. Yeah, that's what we're doing wrong there. So this this is approximately where that line is that we were looking at. And this right here is actually lower than where this line is. So it actually needs to come down a bit like this. Because about where this is, it's come back up from there. This looks about right for that. Right enough for right now. We will dial that in. This comes this will drop down a bit first. Now, for this, we have this little segment right here between this piece right here and the first thoracic axial ring. So we'll just kind of assess that. Uh, 
little bit of an incline there, decline there. approximation of the cephalon here. All right, so from here we're going to kind of work out this line right here. Not quite all the way down here, a little bit further this way. So it kind of comes up a bit this way. And we can kind of see that it goes to approximately one, two, three, four, five, six, six of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, six of these thoracic axial rings. This is approximately where we have the discontinuity at. And then we come down a little ways. And then a bit further. And then pretty fan shape from there. And this line right here. comes down to about, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five of these, one, two, three, four, five of these, is where we come down to here, and then we have a more drastic drop here. And then You can see the getting these shapes worked in here. All right, now then, work in from this a bit. Looking a bit rough, but we're getting there. So now we can kind of start working our way down this way along these axial rings. We've got this very distinct kind of patterning here.
this guy. He's got this kind of like slope down right about here. kind of guessing, checking here, making sure that I'm on the right one. All right, I've got these kind of worked in, kind of working out approximately where our axial ridges are here. And then kind of dialing in these so we'll actually start we started these guys the the top sides of these axial rings going from anterior to posterior we're going to start off with the uh, pygidium and kind of start working our way from posterior anterior with these uh, as we're filling in some of the more detail on these uh, both the axial and the pleural components of the pygidium and the thorax So starting off with this pygidium, we've got the axial component, kind of curves up this way a bit. was about here so
So we're just kind of working in boundaries of this axial ring here. Also kind of working in where how this thoracic component, the posterior edge of this thoracic component, interacts with the pygidium. Kind of comes down a little bit. Seems like this might actually be a little bit more like so what it's feeling like it's going to start looking like. And of course that's sketching. We start off with some lines and then figure out whether or not they actually work for what we're seeing. It's feeling a lot more dialed in. So we got this we got this one all the way to the rear. We got this guy here, got this guy all the way to the rear, this guy right here. Now you're looking at these uh pleural grooves, trying not to get the edges of the pleura confused with the pleural groove that separates the anterior and posterior pleural ridges. So be mindful of that as you're trying to work out where these are, that you're not getting the, the articulation point between the pleura confused with the um, with the pleural gro uh, with the pleural groove here.
All right, now then, we're to the anterior side of that discontinuity, and we have a little bit of mess right here that we're working with. So we're going to try and get that cleared up as quickly as possible. see right here where these two players seem to be going well, kind of crushed together. This is the source of a lot of our fluff. So you got these one, two, three, this third one over, two, three, third one over. It has a rather exaggerated kind of posterior kick out. Cause these two to become kind of crushed in together. over to about halfway down there. Yeah, so this is approximately correct. So this line right here, this trailing edge is about halfway up this guy. Now, this is actually should be about here. Yes. That's why that doesn't look right. So let's try that one more time. This guy over here and he comes over to about halfway. So one, two, three, four. So I only comes up to about halfway down there. This guy, however, is part of the kerfluffle, because he comes this way pretty quickly.
Yeah, there we are. Like I said, it's all just a matter of dialing in where the lines are. We get there eventually. We get there eventually. And this guy almost looks like he's kind of broken over here. And this guy is very much just kind of forced in. These guys are a lot less extreme in how this axial groove kind of works through. Um, there's more of a smooth transition between the axial ring and the player uh, here than there was here, which also tends to make one think that this was more this posterior end was more crushed down by something during deposition of this fossil. This guy actually has more of a... you can see the um, transition for this uh, where this facet is, where this uh, articulating facet is right here. This guy is more... The facet is much more front and center. I mean, it was over on these guys, but... These these two very crushed in player uh, don't really have as much of the uh, facet showing. Don't have any of the facet showing actually. Completely crushed in. This guy over here. This guy over here comes in to here a bit. don't really see this guy over here at all. He's very much articulated underneath this point over here. Alright, so then let's go ahead and clean up some of these reference lines that are no longer necessary. We have a pretty good approximation of where all of our boundary lines are. And now we're going to be filling in some of the being more detailed at this point.
We have a lot of details to start working in now. Let's get our big eraser for some of this. a little bit more like a trial of bite and less like a collection of reference lines. All right, so then. Starting over here, we got this. This guy. See, this guy has this little bit more of a distinction between the uh, interior and posterior pleural ridges. You have a little bit more of this furrow in here. thing over here have this very large posterior pleural ridge and this very narrow anterior pleural ridge that you're kind of playing around with over here All right, we're going to reinforce these lines between the pleura. Up 
to kind of communicate some of that shadowing in there. Also, any last minute modifications we want to these edges. Now we'll just kind of work out our details here with the shadowing. The facets on these guys tend to be a little bit more extreme. The uh, lighting seems to be coming from this direction, so the uh, posterior ends of these playera tend to be more strongly shaded, and the articular facets tend to be more highlighted. Gives you a pretty pretty clear delineation between these components. A little bit more shading over here than you do in a lot of the other bit more shading on these ends. When you're looking at how the shading is sitting on these, it tends to be sitting more towards the anterior, the anterior side of the axial ring when you're looking at where it articulates. So you have this very kind of divided in line and then the kind of shading posterior of that. These guys are a little weird though because you've got this weird kind of highlighting thing going on over here. I 
almost seems to be the exact opposite situation for these guys over here. These guys all just a little bit of wash, just so we can work in some of the highs and lows here in a little bit. Using the side of your lead, and then we're gonna smudge this in kind of create just a general baseline that we can work with a little bit more effectively here in a bit. Kind of smudge some of it into those areas that are that don't have any kind of high or low, they're just the white space. All right, I'm going to take our eraser and kind of clean up around the edges there. All right. leaving a little bit of a highlight at the leading edge of there. Kind of working back for these um, for these axial rings that are forward of the discontinuity. Smudge those in bit. Not playing with shading on these guys, bring them a little bit more in line. Okay, now then let's go ahead and deal with the cephalon here. We've got this eye This upper corner here is approximately right below here, so we'll use that as a reference point to kind of trace this guy in. lower kind of shaded in area over here. This kind of a lid this cover over here. A little bit of a lip to it. It's just a darker colored rock. A 
and we have this kind of not really clearly defined as like a hard line, but more like a shadow. It's L-shaped shadow area here. Because this isn't really like a hard line, it's more of a gentle like trough. So this side of it is also defined more by shading than by, go ahead and reinforce this line, though. So this boundary right here is kind of shade this in, and we're darkly shaded along this edge here. just want the graphite at the top of the tooth of that paper. I'm going to go ahead and smudge it in now. I'm going to go ahead and shade in underneath here. this little groove right here that kind of separates out the glabella from kind of genial section here. The rest of this guy, a little bit of Shading in here, a little bit of darker shading in here, a little bit of lighter shading in here. Give this all just a little bit of a wash. Side of the lead very lightly. Just enough to get graphite on to the surface of that tooth. We'll go ahead and get that smudged on. Reinforce these boundary lines. shading over here. A lot more heavy shading over here. Now for this eye, we're just going to put in a bunch of circles. You notice they kind of have this kind of rounded, it's kind of crisscross pattern in their um, distribution. So we can just kind of give this kind of a not quite lines, slight curve to it. And 
and then just kind of draw some circles on there either in between or where the intersections are bit of a, a little bit more creative shading over here kind of pick out any last little details we want and that is pretty much that yes and you can add or I add the substrate that it's sitting on or you know play around with the shading get the effect that you want this effectively what we're seeing here play around a little bit more of the shading get a little bit more of these details but essentially yes All right, so I think this is a good stopping point for today. Um, as always, if you're following along, if you're drawing along, I'd like to see what other people are doing, how other people are interpreting this. Uh, so uh, drop a picture in the comments. Let me see what you're doing. All right, so that's us for today. As always, continue to explore the world with your pencil. Have fun, and stay sketchy.